Okay, hello everyone. We're ready to get started. Um, Chag Chan Kasameach. I'm Lori from Yad Vashem. I'm sorry I had a miss last week, but I'm thrilled to be here with you all this week. Um, our final session of the master class series that we're offering you. I know I have enjoyed meeting up with you every week and we thank you for coming. We hope that you've enjoyed all these sessions. Um, so with that in mind, I do want to remind you of a few things. To, um, one is that you should have received with this week's email from Dorit um, information about the final evaluation that we do want everybody to fill out if you can. So look for that if you didn't see it. Um, we really would appreciate if you take just a few minutes to fill that out for us. And the other thing is just to let you know that all of the recordings will be available within the next week or two, and Dorit will be sending you an email, a final email, with a link to all of those recordings. So watch out for that as well. Um, also keep in mind that we're just going to hold questions till the end, but you can write them in the chat and we'll have a few minutes at the end for that. So without further ado, I present to you somebody who needs no introduction by now in this series, Rabbi Moshe Kohn, who will be presenting our special Hanukkah lecture, Modern Maccabees, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Thank you, Rabbi Kohn. Thank you, Lori. Okay, let me share my screen here. Okay, the Modern Maccabees. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And again, you know, in the limited time that we have, we're going to try to give you a taste and interest so that you have the wherewithal to uh, perhaps pursue additional studies on your own and locally. So let's begin. I'd like to start with a quote by Franklin D. Roosevelt. He says, courage is not the absence of fear but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. As we, you know, as we begin this discussion of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, we tend to very much romanticize the, 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 the basic facts, which, which most of us are familiar with. And it's important as we begin that we understand that the people, these young people who were so involved that we're going to meet soon, these young people who, who rebelled and stood up against the Nazis, these, these, it wasn't that they weren't afraid, but they had an idealism. They had a commitment to an idea that required them to put their fear aside for what they felt was a greater good. And that's a very important thing because that very much is the message of Hanukkah. As we sit in these days and we look back at what we can learn from the message of Hanukkah, what we can learn is that, that there are goals worth fighting for, even if that fight appears to be absolutely hopeless. Who were these modern Maccabees? So let's, let's meet them. Many Jewish youth organizations came into being in Europe between the two world wars. <clears throat> These movements had different motivations, whether religious, social, <laughs> cultural, or political. Some were communist or socialist, others were Zionist. Some, some movements were both Zionist and socialist. Others were not associated with any political movement or ideology. However, as the Nazis began persecuting Jews throughout Europe, members of all the Jewish youth movements took a leading role in resisting the Nazis and assisting their fellow Jews. Who were these people? They were idealistic young people who joined the youth groups because the youth groups spoke to them about the creation of a better world. Who were these youth groups? What were they? Well, some of the names you're familiar with, right? Some of the names, for example, Hashomer Hatzair, right? What were they? They were a Zionist, radical Zionist. What does that mean? Radical Zionist means they believed every Jew under, regardless of circumstance, should make their way to Israel no matter what. And socialist, and that, that Israel should be a socialist state, share and share alike, where the rich uh, supported the poor and, the, and, and everybody created a society in which we all work for a common good, right? Similar to, to Hashomer, it was drawer, same ideological goals, but the, the participants, the members tended to come from families that were less affluent, right? Gordania 
was also, there was a Zionist socialist movement, as most of them were, but it understood that not everyone is going to make it to Israel right away, right? And that uh, there's also room within Israel for capitalism and for personal personal wealth, et cetera, et cetera. Hanoa Hatzioni, right? They, they believed in the elevation that the purpose of going to Israel was to advance Hebrew, which is ultimately Jewish culture, and that the, the, the nation that we should set up in Israel should be unique, different from others, in that it, it, it relishes and, and advances Hebrew as the biblical language, as a modern language uh, um, taken from the Bible, from the Torah, and, and uh, given new life. Right, and all that came with it, the, the 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 things that we identify now as Hebrew culture, whether it's the songs, the art, the the love of the land, etc. Beitar, right? You're familiar with Beitar, right? These were the students of Jabotinsky. This was the youth group that Menachem Begin was the head of when he was in Poland, and these are revisions. They were they tended to be more right wing. They tended to uh, uh, understand Jewish history as as uh, uh, a preparation for the day that we stand in now, and that we are part of, if you will, a hemshich of history, and that uh, the establishment of Israel uh, is not a a uh, an, an incident, a happening unto itself, but rather it is the the culmination and the continuation of Jewish aspiration throughout history. And Akiva was also a Zionist in Hebrew culture, similar to Hanoi Atzioni. And these are just a few. These are just a few of the youth groups. There was also very religious youth groups, et cetera, et cetera. But these are the ones I'm pointing out because they were the ones who were most involved, if you will, in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Now, many of the Zionist movements were connected to specific movements in Palestine, for example, Beitar, right? And other ideology, Beitar is what today we would call Likud, right? Uh, um, and, and for example, and part of the ideology was to send members off to settle in Palestine. Thus, many of the movement's members participated in agricultural training programs in preparation for immigration. The connection between members of youth movements was very strong, as was their belief that what they were preparing for was very worthwhile and important. This attitude was probably one of the greatest reasons why during the war, youth movement members, despite their age, took a leading role in resisting the Nazis. Look, we don't have to use our imaginations to a great extent here. Anyone who's ever had a child who is really involved in a youth movement, whether B'nai Akiva or Young Judea or even Ashramah Tzair, it doesn't exist as like it did before the war, but it's still there, I think, right? Uh, um, they, there's a certain enthusiasm the young people have, a certain openness and willingness to accept ideologies that, that are given over to them in creative and dynamic ways. It's not just a learning process, but it's a bonding process. And, and this bonding was an essential part of the rebellions, whether they were in Warsaw or other ghettos, and, and the, 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 ultimate, the ultimate uniqueness of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the, the bond that existed between the members of the youth groups. Right before World War II broke out in the fall of 1939, some 100,000 young Jews were involved in the various youth movements. Even though the Nazis outlawed Jewish youth movements and their activities early on, the movements continued in secret. After Germany invaded Poland, signaling the beginning of the war, many youth movement leaders fled the cities of Western and Central Poland for Soviet-held Eastern Poland, hoping to make it from there to Palestine. Soon, however, some of the youth movements decided to send some of their senior members back to German-occupied territory to help their fellow young people trapped by the Nazis and reorganize them for a viable existence as secret underground organizations. This is a very important concept. So yes, certain leaders ran to Soviet eastern side of Poland because at that time, the socialist nature of the Zionist 
movement was very sympathetic. The, the communist movement was sympathetic to it. And they thought from there they could make it to Palestine in order to create a Jewish homeland. But many went back. Now this going back into occupied Poland to help the existing communities is an important point. Why? You have to remember, as we're going to see in a few moments, that when the Nazis sent the Jews to the ghettos, their plan for total annihilation of the Jewish people had not yet been formed. It was in formation. What did they know? They didn't know, for example, that Jews would go to a place called Treblinka or Auschwitz. They didn't have that set up yet. What did they have set up? They did not want the Jews involved in society. They wanted a separation between Judaism and all it represents, the Jewish people, the Judeo-Christian ethic, which included sympathy for the poor, helping of the weak, which were against Nazi ideology. They wanted that separated, separated from non-Jewish. They wanted all Jewish influence taken away from society, A. So their goal was to separate the Jews, but not in a permanent way. That perhaps is the reason the ghettos were never set up by the Nazis to be the end answer. They were just a place where they threw the Jews until they knew what they were going to do with them for the long run. But for the Jews that went there, it's a completely different story. They didn't know that it was a way station to something worse, to slavery or death. They didn't know that. They thought yet again, history has turned from us and we are now once again in a state where anti-Semitism is the rule of law. And like we've weathered it in the past, we can weather it now. So when they went into the ghettos, they went in with the idea that they were gonna set up homes. This is called rupture and continuity. The Nazis were rupturing the very fabric of Jewish society, but the Jews were looking for continuity. So they wanted to set up soup kitchens and classes, the youth movements active in the various ghettos of Poland embarked on a series of activities such as organizing study courses, seminars, ideological workshops, and other such programs. They were also in charge of publishing underground newspapers. And in Warsaw, the youth movement set up courier networks to keep in contact with other ghettos, right? They, they established uh, soup kitchens and, and communal help organizations. They were very, very involved in continuity. Because again, you remember that the story that we study up till now in all of our classes is an evolving story. It talks about it, it, the difference between 1940 and 1942 is a world apart. Between 1938 and 1940, a completely different world. So when we study anything, we have to put it into a very defined context. So here you have pictures of an underground school in Kovno, right, of a soup kitchen in Warsaw, and of a famous, famous member of the underground, of a partisan, if you will, Frumka uh, Platnika, who, who was ultimately killed in the ghetto in 1943, but was very involved in keeping the ghettos communicating sharing information, what was happening from one place to the other, so that there was the, 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 one of the things that these young people did was they created a system of communications, whereas the Nazis tried to rupture that. It was, the Nazis didn't want Jews communicating with other Jews to put together pieces of a puzzle. Unlike many of the older, more established Jewish communal leaders who felt that this too shall pass, the leaders of the youth movement saw the future with surprising clarity. They were convinced that they had no real chance of survival under the Nazis and that their only chance was armed resistance, even until the death of their last man. Thus, after the final solution was put into effect, the youth, youth movements began organizing themselves for resistance against the Nazis. Their idealism, the 
courage that these young people had, their willingness to see a greater picture allowed them to assess the reality of their situation as it changed until they came to the conclusion that in fact, there was no permanence in the ghetto and that continuity was a fallacy. With that background of who these modern Maccabees are, let us begin our examination of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Before World War II, Warsaw was the center of the Jewish population of Europe. Jews had lived there for over 500 years. By the eve of the war, fully 30% of the city was Jewish. In 1939, the Germans conquered Poland very quickly, and World War II began. The Germans had planned to deport the Jews. However, the plans didn't immediately succeed. And so, as an interim measure, Jews were concentrated in cities and near railways, and these became ghettos. The ghettos were not an end in and of themselves. They were interim measures, again, on the way to deportation and then later on to mass murder. Once the ghetto became a reality, the Jews trapped inside were its prisoners. They could no longer come and go freely as they wanted to. They literally went to bed one night and woke up the next morning surrounded by walls. And now at the entrance to the ghetto stood very intimidating symbols of authority, German guards and Polish policemen. Any Jew who was found outside the ghetto was unceremoniously shot. The Jews were sealed inside the ghetto. In April of 1942, the population of the ghetto was approximately 400,000 people. The, this is what it looked like in April of 1942. At that time, the Warsaw Ghetto was approximately a little more than 20% of the overall population of Warsaw, and they were crammed into 2.5% of the area of Warsaw. So the 400,000 people created tremendous overcrowding, and with it, all the affectations of overcrowding, the lack of privacy, the lack of space to, to breathe. There were respites if you had the money to afford them, but 90, 98% of the people in the ghetto were, were, were poverty stricken and, and their poverty was growing because it was almost impossible to, to make a living. You sold off what you had and when you had nothing left, you, you began that long process of deterioration. As a result, the ghetto was in a high state of agitation to the to a large extent, because of the overcrowding, because of the lack of food, because of the need for 
smuggling, because of the Nazi pressure, because of a variety of reasons. And one of them was because of all these things, rumors spread very quickly. Rumors that came from other places outside the ghettos of what was going on beyond the walls of the ghetto. They, they, it, it, it spread like wildfire. And one of those significant rumors was something crawl, called the Grzanowski Report. What was that? It was an eyewitness account about the atrocities in Chelmno. Chelmno, as we know, was the first camp extermination camp. It was the first camp set up for the express purpose of murdering Jews. The first, if you will, killing fabric, killing um, um, center, killing manufacturing center. The, their business was to kill. They were the ones who began using um, trucks with the, the, the engine exhaust turned back into the truck and they would drive around and the people died. That's what the it was the, it was the, it was the, the experiment, experimentation place where the Nazis perfected the murder of the Jewish people. And th this fellow, Zalma Barviner, he escaped from Chelmno. And he went under the pseudonym Yaakov Grzanowski, and he managed to make his way from Chelmno to the ghetto, Warsaw ghetto. And he gave a detailed information about his week-long experience with the Sander Commando at that death camp to the ghetto's Einig Shabbos, right? Emanuel Ringelblum's archives. And word got around. And it created a very high anxiety because the, the, without knowing anything else, they, the, the Jews in the ghetto understood the Nazis were not their friends. And they understood that the overcrowding was unbearable. And they, they now on top of all that, of all their problems that existed within the ghetto itself, they began to hear of things like extermination camps, like evacuation, and of duplicity on the part of the Nazis to an extent that had not existed heretofore. And what was the initial rumor, the initial Jewish reaction to the rumor? So it, it stood basically on three uh, pillars. And, and it was expressed well by Dr. Shipper, who was a professor at the University of Warsaw, and he was a, a Zionist historian. He said that here we hear rumors of the liquidation of ghettos. He said it's impossible to liquidate a population of a half a million souls, referring to the Warsaw Ghetto. The Germans will not dare annihilate the largest Jewish community in Europe. The first pillar was the size. They will have to reckon with world public opinion. Though they, right, they, the second pillar was, we live in a modern age. You can't hide the, the destruction of a half a million people. And then the Western civilized Western society will not tolerate it. And thirdly, the assurance of the governor general, Governor Frank, right, that Warsaw, Radom, and Krakow will remain. He said, he told the Jews, he was relating to the Jews on a daily basis. And he said, listen, we're not, he said, we're not going to wipe out the Jews. People just don't want you around. So everything will be made, it will be put together in ghettos and, and Warsaw will be one of the ones that exist. So there was the, the, the size, the ethics of the, of the Western world, the outside world, and ultimately the, their ability to make sense of the long range German plan. And it made no sense to wipe out a captive slave labor uh, community that the Nazis had in complete control of themselves. Yet, the, 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 the rumors persisted until on July 20th, Anam Chanyanko, who was the head of the Judenrat in Warsaw, went to speak to the Nazi authorities. In the morning, and this is taken from his diary of July 20th, 1942. In the morning at 7.30, the Gestapo, at the Gestapo, I asked Sergeant Mende, you see his picture underneath the Yad Vashem logo, the rumors about deportation. He replied he had heard nothing. I turned to SS, Obensturm Führer Karl Brandt, you see his picture 
next to the Yad Vashem Lobo. He also knew nothing. I went to the deputy chief, chief of Section 3, Sher, who was the, the Nazi in charge of the, the, the overall ghetto. And he expressed the surprise at hearing the rumors and informed me that he too knew nothing about it. Finally, I asked whether I could inform the population that their fears were groundless. He said I could and that all the talk was utter nonsense. I ordered Jacob Ledgkin, who you see a picture of there, who was not a very popular person. He was the head of the Jewish police to make a public announcement. This was written in Chernyanko's diary on July 22nd, 1942, the Great Depression, the Great Deportation, which we're now going to hear about through the incredibly emotional laden words of Abraham Lewin, began two days later. about the expulsion of Jews is spreading like lightning through the town. Jews run by in confusion, terrified. The Jewish streets are an appalling sight. The gloom is indescribable. On Zamanov Street, the Germans pulled people out of a tram and killed them on the spot. The roundup was halted at three o'clock. The savagery of the police during the roundup, the murderous brutality. They drag girls from the rickshaws, empty out flats, and leave the property strewn everywhere. How did Jews hide? In couches, in beds, cellars, attics. Six Sona Street, 99 victims. Today, 12,000 murders. The violence of the police, the breakup of families. Mendrovsky Polo, it hurts so much. Only the workers in the workshops seem to still be safe. A meeting of Oinik Shabbos, its tragic character. They discussed the question of ownership and the transfer of the archive to America, to the YIVO, if we all die. It's a wonder that people can endure so much suffering, living the whole day on a knife edge between life and death, and clinging with all their might to life in the hope that they may be among the 10 survivors. Early this morning, the Germans and the rioters spread through the ghetto in the course of five minutes, they drove out all the occupants on Gensha Street, between Zamanov and Lubyechka Streets. They pay no attention to papers. Eclipse of the sun. Universal blackness. My Luba was taken away. I have no words to describe my desolation. I ought to go after her, to die but I have no strength to take such a step. I will never be consoled as long as I live to fall into the hands of such pushers. How tragic it is, a life together of over 21 years has met such a tragic end. The sight of the streets, the pavements are fenced off. You walk in the middle of the road, Certain streets are completely closed off with fences and gates, and you can't get in there. The impression is of cages. The whole of Jewish Warsaw has been thrown out of the buildings. There's a full-scale relocation of all Jews who have not yet been rounded up and are still in the town. The pain because of the loss of Luba is becoming more intense. My soul can find no peace for not having gone after her when she was in danger. Even though I could have also disappeared, and Aura would have been left an orphan. 
There's talk of a second front in France and Holland. If these things had happened four or five weeks ago, perhaps we would have been saved from the catastrophe. Six in the evening. Jewish policemen have returned from the town and said that the action is continuing. So, all our hopes that the bloody action has ceased now have been swept away. How will we survive? How will we be able to bear it? People talk of the special danger that now threatens children. A terrible dread seizes me when I think of the fate of Aura. She has no documents and is in danger. Since Friday, no news reaches us from the other side of the wall. The terrible appearance of the streets, transformed into an Umschlagplatz. The crowds of Jews with packs in their backs, streaming from the streets of the ghetto. Everyone who's camped out on the street. The Svecha family has perished. He gave himself up after seeing how his wife and two children were taken. Initially, he went with us to Geisha Street. Later, he went back, gave himself up, and was sent away. I feel a great compassion and admiration for this straightforward person. We tremble at every noise and shot that comes from the street. Today is the 52nd day in the greatest and most terrible slaughter in history. We are the tiny remnants of the greatest Jewish community in the world. A Jew has returned to our workshop who worked as a grave digger in Treblinka. According to what he said, not only Jews from Warsaw and of the Gubernia are being exterminated in Treblinka, but Jews from all over Europe, from France, Belgium, Holland, among others. Those who are far away cannot imagine our bitter situation. They will not understand and will not believe that day after day, thousands of men, women, and children, innocent of any crime, were taken to their death. Almighty God, why did this happen? And why is the whole world deaf to our screams? How terrible it is that a whole generation, millions of Jews, has suddenly become a community of martyrs who have had to die in such a cruel, degrading, and painful manner and go through the torments of hell before going to the gallows. Earth, Earth, do not cover our blood and do not keep silent so that our blood will cry out until the ends of time and demand revenge for this crime that has no parallel in our history and in the whole of human history. writes through January. Let's stop now and try to get a sense of where we are in history. We already learned July 22nd to 30. We heard about it. Uh, approximately 65,000 Jews were taken for resettlement. Those with proper papers at that point were exempt, as we heard in the diary, that those who were working in factories were, were more secure, but everyone else, 65,000 people. That was, that was already two days after the diary entry we saw from Chernyanko. Realizing what was about to happen, Adam Chernyanko committed suicide on July 23rd, the day after the great deportation began. So the Jewish people now were in a high tense, high tense of anxiety. Their leadership was he committed suicide. There was a lack of security there. All of a sudden, all their three pillars of security were gone. 65,000 people were taken in a matter of days. On July 31st to August 1st, 20,000 Jews volunteered for resettlement. Those who still maintain that you can't dis destroy an entire people. The Germans have to use us in some way. They volunteered for jam and bread one kilo of jam and six, six and a half kilo of bread, right? And they, of course, went 
to Treblinka. Everyone was going to Treblinka. July 31st to August 14th, German and Lithuanian soldiers and Jewish police search for and forcibly dragged off any Jew without papers. Now it wasn't a matter of being able to work even. It was a matter, did you have legitimate papers that allowed you to stay in the ghetto August 15th to September 6th. Anyone caught on the street could be taken, especially women and children. Papers were meaningless. People were afraid to go out into the street. There, that means you couldn't procure food. The, the, um, supplies were, were dwindling and it was absolutely unsafe no matter who you were to be out on the street. Children couldn't play. They couldn't do underground. It was complete hiding almost. September 6th to 21st, 1942, an intensive selection known as the Kessel began, right? In the space of 60 days, approximately two, the movie said 265, other sources have 299, approximately 300,000 people were sent to their deaths in Treblinka. And then it sort of stopped. Why did it stop? because Treblinka was overwhelmed. It was, Treblinka was not Auschwitz. Treblinka was primitive compared to Auschwitz and they just couldn't handle the numbers. So they, had, they begged for the deportations to stop in order to give them a chance to liquidate and dispose of the Jews they already have. Approximately 60,000 Jews remained in the ghetto. What was the initial response to this great deportation? So when the people were going, being resettled, quote unquote, to the east, I once came home for lunch and found my parents beside themselves. Uh, unrecognizable, really. And uh, my father said, we have something to tell you. Actually, we have to tell you two things because your mother and I have different stories. So let your mother speak first. And my mother just said, took some box and says, Henry, these are poison pills. If you are caught by Germans, take them immediately. So the first response is absolute um, yiyush, an inability to trust the situation at all, Reason, realizing how helpless we were. If you, if you get caught by the Germans, we can no longer trust at all. We now see none of our three um, anchors will help us. Better you should take your own life. The message was, don't believe the Germans. If you can, you have to hide. If you can, you have to escape. You have to run. You, 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 if you want to, to, to try to, to, to save your life, because there is no life beyond Treblinka. They knew, right? We heard they knew about the concentration camp. And, and they, they understood young people. The goal was we can go under no circumstances. We will not trust the Germans. And therefore, if you can run away, run away. If you can hide, hide. At that meeting, we started doing the same what the Poles were doing, just telling that the, the, the traitors should be killed. And during that meeting, uh, during that meeting, it has been decided to kill Mr. Lakin. And Lakin was a head of the Jewish police at that time. After Sharinsky was taken by, uh, was almost assassinated and taken by the Germans. And Lakin was a small bastard, <laughs> you can imagine. And then we cornered him. We cornered Lakin. I mean, of course, I, I put my bullets into him, one or two bullets into him. Whether my bullets kill him or somebody else's bullets, I don't know. And the third was, we had nothing to lose. So we began to fight. There was no longer any fallacy that cooperation or sympathy, cooperation with the Germans or sympathy from the Germans was a reality. So 
Jews began to fight. And they began to organize themselves. And they began to, amongst the youth groups, amongst these young people, they began to realize that destiny was in their own hands. On January 18th, 1943, over 1,000 German, Lithuanian, and Latvian soldiers and militiamen marched into the ghetto and demanded 8,000 Jews to assemble at the Umschlagplatz for deportation. Treblinka had caught up, and now they resumed the deportations. Most Jews disappeared into hiding places. The Germans launched a massive search and snatch every Jew they could find for deportation. As the Germans were leading a line of captured Jews to the trains, a group of ZOB fighters opened fire on the Germans. For the first time in the history of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Germans encountered armed resistance. The German forces retreated in confusion. Nevertheless, the action continued for four days. On January 21st, the action ended. Approximately 5,000 Jews were captured. Some Germans and most of the Jewish fighters were killed. But something unique had happened. The Jews, for the first time, shot bullets. They fought. They threw rocks. They refused to cooperate with the German forces. And the Germans were shocked. This was out of character for what they understood the Jews to be. They understood the Jews to be untermenschen, not capable of courage of being able to fight. And so they were shocked. They retreated. Now, while this was going on, this was part of something perhaps bigger. Not only did the Jews rebel for the first time, but things were going badly for the Germans all over. In Russia, on the, on the Eastern Front, they were suffering terrible losses. Up until the point where in February, a month after this January attempt to restart the deportation, on the 2nd of February, really less than a month, three weeks later, the Nazi 6th Army in Stalingrad, having exhausted their ammunition and food, surrendered after the five months, one week and three days of fighting. Only 91,000 soldiers out of an army of a quarter of a million survived the battle. Stalingrad was the largest defeat ever experienced by the German army. So there was a sense, there was a sense that something was changing. Jews were rebelling, right? The, the Nazis were suffering defeat. Maybe, maybe there was an opportunity, an opportunity to create a different reality. So what did the Jews do? Well, on January 22nd, after this physical rebellion against the Nazis. After fighting, there was seen to be a cessation of the deportations. The Nazis were not entering the ghetto. So from January 22nd, immediately they began to prepare because they knew this wouldn't last forever. From January to April 19th, deportations were halted. And what did the Jews do? One can say without exaggeration that the entire population, from the young to the old, was engaged in preparing hiding places. The ghetto looked like an army camp. In the courtyards, one could see Jews carrying sandbags, bricks in line. They worked day and night, especially industrious were the bakers, because bread was purchased in great quantities for the preparation of rusts, a type of... Um, uh, uh, preparation that used bread but gave it lasting power, that it wouldn't mold, right? No one thought of willingly going to Treblinka. They knew what their destiny would be if they cooperated with the Nazis. The survivors prepared everything necessary for remaining in hiding for months. They were prepared to do what they had to, to not go on any deportation. And the key words in this diary entry of Yisrael Gutman is the entire population. The entire population began to prepare for rebellion, unlike other ghettos, where also they realized what might happen. But 
they couldn't get the population to go behind them. In Vilna, right, uh, um, Abba Kovna, he understood what was going on before this, but he couldn't engage the, 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 the population of the ghetto to support an overall rebellion. They were afraid. They, 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 they thought perhaps there was still hope. What was preparing like? They are all ready to uh, build bunkers underneath because uh, I guess this was truly the end. And the deportations continued. And when we were on Buen Fratesca, this was the first time that we heard about Treblinka. Because, you know, people like uh, to uh, fool themselves. None of us, I mean, I, this goes for uh, my parents and everybody, we just couldn't believe that he did, that were herding us, transporting us to, uh, as they call, Vernichtungklag, you know, the uh, places where they are going to uh, gas us, you know, kill us off. The only chance to survive is to dig bunkers, dig, and camouflage in a way that no one can, okay, yet yeah, one, two, three opening. And that was a mass action to start building bunkers, people uh, out of a block of apartments, people of uh, same kind, uh, you know, each other, families. So they started all digging and preparing some hiding part of a, a, a floor or something some rooms so no one could see and uh, of course underground whoever had the possibility the means financial or otherwise had friends uh, was trying to get to the Aryan side i had didn't have that possibility i didn't have any money and i didn't have any friends on the Aryan side and I was trying to get into the the Jewish fighting organization where my friends that were working with me. What was this Jewish fighting organization? Well, it was called the ZOB, the Jewish fighting organization. It was headed up by a young man, a youth group representative who came back to Poland, a Zionist, Hashomer Atzair, Mordechai Anilevich. And he wrote, and this was on a poster that was plastered all over, which was a major form of communication in the days leading up to the actual uprising. In January 22nd, 1943, six months will have elapsed since the start of the deportations from Warsaw, the great deportations. 300,000 of our brothers and sisters were transported to and brutally murdered in the Treblinka death camp. We received reports left and right about Jews being killed. As we listen to these terrible tidings, we wait for our own time to come. It was inevitable, he said. Jewish masses, the hour is drawing near. You must be prepared to resist. Do not give yourself up like sheep to the slaughter. Our slogan must be, all are ready to die as human beings. The idea is that we can, we must grasp hold of our destiny. How will history remember us, right? Now this idea of sheep to the slaughter is a traditional Jewish idea. Right, we have many times throughout history, whether it's Masada, whether it's it's the the children of Kohen, the Kohen Gadol, uh, Rabbi Yochanan, who took their own lives because they saw that to stay alive would ultimately deteriorate their posi the position of the Jewish people in the world, and therefore a statement had to be made. They were facing total evil, and now. There was no longer a time to negotiate, but now was the time to fight. Now, this was a, a decision that crossed all facets of the community. For example, Mark Edelman, who was head of the Bund. The Bund was an organization that, that was anti-Zionist. They didn't want to go to Israel. They wanted to stay in Poland and create a Yiddish-speaking community in Poland. They, they were not religious. They had no 
desire to live in a Jewish homeland. They, they had a language that they were more comfortable with and they wanted to exercise a right to speak that Labun. Mark Edelman, he wrote, we then decided that a joint battle organization should be formed. He made an alliance with Anilevich, right? And that its purpose should be to prepare armed resistance for the time when the Germans might attempt to repeat the extermination procedure in the Warsaw Ghetto. We realized that only through coordinated work and our utmost joint efforts could any results at all be expected. The, the political situation in Israel today is similar to what it was before the war and during much of the war in Poland. There was bickering, there was arguments, there was an inability to work together, a lack of respect one to the other. All this changed after the realization of what the Nazis had in mind set in, the, the Jews that remained, those 60,000 Jews realized we must overcome our differences and work together. The revisionists, right? We are going to war, adopt the slogan, rise up and fight. Do not despair of the chance for rescue. He who fights for his life has a chance of being saved. Find the courage to indulge in acts of madness. Put a stop to the degrading resignation expressed by such statements as we are all bound to die. It's a lie. We too are deserving of life. You merely must know how to fight for it. There is hope. Maybe the, the war will turn against the Nazis. Maybe fate will smile on us. Maybe the Nazis will, will be amazed at Jewish, whatever it is, he said. We're going to fight. We're going to join together with the ZOB. We're joining together with the Bund. We're joining together to fight. And even the Frum world, the, the, the traditional Torah world under the leadership of Rav Menachem Zemba, who was in fact one of the Gedole Yisrael of the time, he writes, from the beginning, we should have used every opportunity and tactic to alert the conscience of the world. All we can do now, when it's already too late, is resist to the best of our abilities. We may not surrender ourselves voluntarily into enemy hands. There is a machlekes in the Frum community is fighting the Nazis' suicide. And his psaq was that there is a chance, an unlikely chance, but there's a chance that you can survive the fight. But by this time, he said, to do nothing is no way to survive doing nothing. So the community united behind the idea of a rebellion. And the rebellion began. Then when the organization of the uprising started, my function was to go after curfew and paste the, uh, the posters calling uh, the Jews to armed rebellion on the walls of the buildings. Uh, my father, of course, was uh, beside. He didn't know what I was doing, but when I was coming home after the curfew, it was uh, it was a terrible thing. They were terribly, terribly worried. What was that like? How could you maneuver yourself without being caught? You were streetwise. Uh, you know, there were patrols, but it was dark, and we knew the streets. And we're going through the valley, through the backyards. Uh, uh, you know, we're risking uh, our lives, but we were young, and uh, one was going with a bucket and the uh, uh, and the brush uh, to paste the wall, and the other one was running with the roll of posters and uh, clipping them. You know, it was uh, uh, it was fun. You know, it was, uh, we, we were too young, I think, to realize how dangerous it really was. It was a kind of a sport. What did it mean um, to you? Oh, I, uh, I was adamant that uh, I, uh, the order of the day from Hashomer Atayir was that we are not going to be taken alive. 
you know, we are not going to be allowed to take on the transport. And I was all uh, hyped up with it. I knew that this is exactly what I am going to do. We are not going to go just like that. So uh, there was just a conviction. We are just not going. So they began the process of fighting. They had commands from the youth group, Hashomer Atzair, to under no circumstance allow yourself to go on a transport. And everybody did their bit. She put up posters. She maintained communication one to the other and tried to engage the people. Now, this was happening before Pesach, these this pr preparations from January until April, and came that fateful Pesach. And it's important for us to mention it and speak of it. It was pass, Passover Eve, 1943. And we had arranged everything in the house in preparation for the holidays. We even had matzot, everything. We had made the beds. The policeman who lived with us always told us everything that was going to happen. He came on that night and told us, you should know that the ghetto is surrounded with Ukrainians. Tonight will not be a good night. He had heard this. We took all our belongings and went into the bunker. Why wait? So we took what we still had at home whatever food we had, everything, and went down into the bunker and waited. They, on the one hand, they prepared continuity. They, they set the table to observe Pesach as it had always been observed, with, as to the best of their ability. And on the other hand, they prepared for the ultimate rupture. This was the Jewish way. This was what was unique about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. It wasn't a suicide mission, but it was a mission that they didn't expect to win in the conventional sense of winning. Another diary entry by Tuvia Borzakowski. Amidst this destruction, the table in the center of the room looked incongruous with glasses filled with wine and with the family seated around. The rabbi reading the Haggadah, the rabbi was Rabbi Zembez. His reading was punctuated by explosions and the rattling of machine guns. The faces of the family around the table were lit by the red light from the burning buildings nearby. And while they were making Seder, the rebellion progressed. Simcha Reitem writes, on April 19th, which was Erev Pesach, at four in the morning, German soldiers crossed the Nalwiki intersection on their way to the central ghetto, walking in an endless procession. Behind them were tanks, armored vehicles, light cannons, and hundreds of Waffen SS units. They were now prepared to fight the Jews, not just round them up. They look like they're going to war, I said to Tsipara, my companion at the post. Suddenly, I felt how very weak we were. What force did we have against an army, against tanks and armored vehicles? We had nothing but pistols and grenades. Now, after the 22nd, and <clears throat> we knew what's going on, where they go to Treblinka to death, so, buy, buy, but the Poles didn't want to sell us. The army, the Polish army, we paid for one revolver, three to five thousand dollars. For one bullet, ten dollars. Now, during the main or so-called resettlement, there was a very complicated political situation in the Warsaw Ghetto, because there were so many parties. And the, 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 the Zionist right and left and revisionist, they couldn't get together. But on the 28th, they formed, they somehow they came together and they formed 22 groups. They called, one was called GOB, the Jewish Fighting Organization, and the other one was called Irgun Zweile Umi. This was the revisionist, which were the followers of Jabotinsky 
and Trumpeldor. Trumpeldor. So what was the main thing now? Buy arms. Because they were, the ZOB had 700 people and Tsvai Leumi had 300. But could they have thousands of the young people? But there were no arms. The Polish government in London at that time sent us 50 revolvers with munition, 50 hand grenades, and 4 kilograms of explosive. We bought 4,000 on the Aryan side for money, 4,000 liters of gasoline. So when the tanks attack it, we'll burn it. Now, we trained the youngsters. As I said, we were preparing ourselves to fight. The, the <clears throat> underground, the 700s and the 300, they were trained. But what? We didn't have any guns, any, um, what do you call it, these guns, uh, so rifles. with sticks. Eh? With some bayonets and rifles. Rifles. We didn't have rifles, so they trained with sticks. <coughs> so <clears throat> there was a bunker. In every building there was a bunker where people had to hit in case of a new action, and there was a physician assigned to every bunker. I was, I had 70 or 80 people in the bunker, <clears throat> assigned to my bunker from my building. And, oh, unforgettable, the first night of Pesach, the first Seder. But before I tell you about this, we had spies, Jewish spies on the Aryan side, and the German knew that they won't get us out, so simple. They left to fight. And they told us how they prepared the German, what they had against us. It's 2,000 SS soldiers. Listen to this. Three detachments of artillery, 1,000 of German police, 1,000 of Polish police, and 1,000 of Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians in the black uniforms the supporting police. Against them, we were 700 in the Jewish fighting organization and 300 in the other organization. But the Germans knew it won't come easy. And on the first Seder, on April 19th, 1943, we get a note calls from the other side, the Germans are surrounding the ghetto. So, Immediately, everybody went to the bankers and me, I had some medicine. What medicine did I have? Aspirin and nothing else. But, and some material, you know, for wounds. And all the soldiers went to their posts. And on the 19th in the morning, I show you on the, my drawing there, through the Muranoska gate, next to the Umstrapplatz, a platoon of German soldiers came through the Muranoska street into the ghetto and went to the Muranoska square, singing, you know, the northern people, the Obermenschen, Supermenschen, singing, happy. Now, when they came on the Muranoska street, there were two buildings there with flags. One Jewish flag, with the Magen David, and one Polish flag. The boys, the Jewish boys knew that every bullet has to kill. Otherwise, they won't come out. So when they stopped singing and standing there on the Muranaska Square, they came under fire. And it was hell for them because so many fell. They threw their guns and they ran away. Now, every piece of arms, every revolver, every gun, every submachine gun were collected. That's how the, <clears throat> how the underground got submachine guns. There was not one, one was only in the whole ghetto. And uniforms, everything was collected. Two tanks went on Muranoska Street, on Zamenhofa Street, also from Muranoska Gate, 
on Zamenhofa Street, I'll show it to you, to Mila 8, and there they were waiting for them, two times. They threw the Molotov cocktails on them and burned two tanks. So the Germans left. They were scared. They left the ghetto and they knew they can't fight just on open streets. <coughs> so they sent planes and the planes started to bomb us. It's impossible to put into words, wrote Mordechai Nalevich, what we have been through. One thing is clear, what happened exceeded our boldest dreams, he wrote. The Germans ran twice from the ghetto. One of our com companies held out for 40 minutes and another for more than six hours. Several of our companies attacked the dispersing Germans. Our losses in manpower is minimal. That is also an achievement. I feel that great things are happening. And what we dared do is of great, enormous importance. What we need urgently, grenades, rifles, machine guns, and explosive. It is impossible to describe the conditions under which the Jews of the ghetto are now living. Only a few will be able to hold out. The remainder will die sooner or later. Their fate is decided. The fact that we are remembered beyond the ghetto walls encourages us in our struggle. Peace, go with you, my friend. Perhaps... We, we may still meet again. The dream of my life has risen to become a fact. Self-defense in the ghetto will have been a reality. Jewish armed resistance and revenge are facts. I have been a witness to the magnificent, heroic fighting of Jewish men in battle. Binyamin Mead was a member of the Bund. And he was someone on the other side of the ghetto. He was watching this with people who thought he was a non-Jew. And I was walking on the streets. And uh, the whole city was in flame because the whole city was burning. So many blocks, not one, so many blocks. And I looked at these blocks, but the worst thing for me was the Eastern Sunday, when I was in the church, listening to all the sermons of the, of the priests, and I blend in with them together, and I came out. The priest was standing in the front, greeting all the parishioners. And they were dressed in their best clothing on Sunday. Most of them took their children to their, to their carousel, which was with music, which was around that. You could see with the naked eye what was going on in the ghetto, the flames and the burning, everything. And you were just listening to the expressions, Jews are burning not burning. Jews are Zitkisches Majo. Jews are frying. I was in that environment of the people. Until today I cannot understand where did I take the strength not to scream, not to reveal who I am. That I look at my people burning and I cannot say anything. And here the carousel is Drive, running, the people are on the carousel with the parents happy. We can't imagine, but how difficult it was. The fighting went on until May of 1945, when a message was sent by General Stroop, the Nazi in charge of destroying the, jet, the ghetto. The Jewish quarter in Warsaw no longer exists. And that was symbolized by the destruction of the great synagogue on Tlamaki Street. And we conclude with a quote from the Warsaw ghetto fighterman, Yitzchak Zuckerman, who he, he fought in the ghetto, he survived, he came to Israel, and he and his wife established the Kibbutz Lochmea ghetto in northern Israel. He writes, I don't think there's any real need to analyze the uprising in military terms. 
This was a war of less than a thousand people against the mighty army and no one doubted how it was likely to turn out. This isn't a subject for study in a military school, not the weapons, not the operations, not the tactics. If there's a school to study the human spirit, there it should be a major subject. The really important things were inherent in the force shown by Jewish youth after years of degradation to rise up against the destroyers and determine what death would choose, Treblinka or uprising. I don't know if there's a standard to measure that. This is the story of the resurgence of the Jewish pride and ability to fight, not only to, and of course, spiritual resistance is essential to our survival, but so is Hishtadla, so is the need to fight. And this is the beginning of what we now have today, the state of Israel and the, the armed forces of the state of Israel. And this is really the story of modern Maccabees. And with that, I'll stop sharing and try to answer any questions you might have. Do we have questions? We had a few questions. There was one question regarding the number of German soldiers that were actually killed in the fighting. Do we have I don't know. numbers? Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions they would like to send in? Seeing that there aren't any questions, if anybody uh, wants to chime in in a minute, um, with that, I will say fair. Uh, well, as we say in Hebrew, we say lihitraot. We say goodbye, but we say we hope to see you again. And with the hopes of the, uh, the hopes of everybody with the um, vaccines that seem to be coming out, I can tell you that as soon as the skies open up and the world opens up again, uh, here in Yerushalayim at Yad Vashem, we will be waiting for you with open arms. So we hope that opportunity comes your way, that you have a chance to visit us in person uh, when that becomes possible. But until then, Yad Vashem is offering <laughs> webinars all the time in English, and you can find those on our website. So even though this series right now is ending, we really hope you stay in touch and we hope that you uh, become a regular participant in all, in all of our programs Sorry. until the day comes when we can welcome you in person. Sorry. 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 Laurie, Sorry. Anna Berger. Yes. Thank okay. you. And of course, yes, we have one final goodbye. I know. Yes. Go ahead. It's not, it's not a question, but the stunning thing about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was that it lasted longer uh, as a defiance against the Jews than most countries in Europe's armies against the Nazi occupation. That was such a stunning neshoma. I mean, yes, you are 100% correct. Thank you for sharing. I think we should give final word to Rabbi Figder, yeah. who is uh, the executive director, the rabbi of the St. Kilda Shul in Melbourne. And it's really, this whole thing was his idea and his uh, brainchild. And I hope we, we did you proud. And uh, Rabbi Figder. You did. Thank you very much. Today was tonight's was really uplifting. It was a wonderful way to end, to hear about Jewish resistance and what can be achieved when people get together. In fact, really what this course, whole course was about was what people can achieve when you get together. Um, the fact is that Rabbi Moshe Khan, you were the one who first wrote to me many months ago, but it was a team effort. It was Laurie, it was Dorit, it was Searle. In fact, I'm trying to think of all the people we, who email we emailed between each other for the month month or two leading up to this so a big issue to all of you who led classes including if you could pass on please rabbi or to, or laurie to, to the other the martzim the other leaders but also a big thank you to the hundreds of people i think we at one point in time we had well over 200 people for one of the sessions sorry well over 200 devices my wife and I, by the way, are sharing a device at the moment. So there are many places where you've got, we've got doubles. So really, we, we really reached out to hundreds of people through this course. And it's only because of a team effort. So I say thank you very much, Abarf, for Sinkula Shul. And thank you to all of the participants as well. Because we, we, the people involved in this, couldn't have made this come together unless you'd signed up and said we want to be part of it. 
So thank you very much. Chag Urim Sameach. May this bring light to the rest of the world.